Good afternoon, Salt Lake City. Talk with Ted, number 35. Uh, I've got a great guest today, John Ubaldo, and I entitled this show, uh, John Ubaldo's Got a Farm, because uh, John Ubaldo is an interesting guy that I went to college with, Skidmore College. Uh, shout out to Skidmore College back in the uh, mid-1980s, and John was legendary by the time he was 19, 20 years old. Uh, he was, I think, the class of 88 ahead of me. Uh, but a legendary hippie, a grateful deadhead uh, back in the day. We uh, enjoyed some parties together, and he's got an interesting life. He was an investment banker in the 90s in New York City, and after uh, the 9-11 attacks, uh, he lost a, fr a good friend, I think his brother-in-law, in the 9-11 attacks, and after some reflection, uh, sought a career change and ended up buying a farm in upstate New York, 185 acres, and uh, started off with some chickens and pigs and added cows, and uh, he's a farmer, and they've made a documentary of him. He's an amazing guy. Uh, in addition to his farm, he has a market down in Pound Ridge, New York, which is in Westchester County, as well as his own little uh, retail store, uh, uh, diner, I'll call it. Uh, but they've made a movie about his life, The Bullish Farmer, and it's basically about... Uh, three things, the profitability of small-time farming, the health consequences of small-time farming, and the community aspects of small-time farming. And so uh, I've got a farmer on the show. Uh, who knew that uh, John Ubaldo would grow up to be a farmer? So he's going to be calling in in a few minutes. Um, another uh, great guest. I'm fortunate the phone's ringing here. Hello? Um I've had some great guests lately. Uh, I think we got John on the phone here. Uh, last week I had Robert W. Turner, played a stint in the NFL. He's a sociologist that's written a book about uh, transitioning from football to life outside of football. And next week I've got in sort of that same theme, I think it's an important topic. So many young people are involved in athletics and the colleges are so deeply involved in athletics. And uh the athletics provide an opportunity for uh, advancement for the young people to learn social skills and to uh, eventually segue out of those athletics. But um, Malcolm Lemons is, is another one. He gave up a career of overseas basketball, wanted to pursue other interests, and now he's an author, lecturer, uh, podcaster, and uh, he's going to be joining me next week. Two weeks after that, I'll have another author on, another Skidmore College uh, grad. I'm uh, tapping into my Skidmore uh, network for my guests here. But a woman by the name of Christine Rusty Eno. I'm not sure if I pronounced that name right, but Christine was a classmate of mine who back in 2005, I think it was, was violently attacked in front of her two children. And she's written a book that's going to be released on July 9th. I'm going to have her on that day. It's called All the Silent Spaces. And it's about her and that experience and coming to grips with not only that, but I believe some other issues that had happened to her earlier uh, in her life. And I know that she's excited about uh, this book and I'm excited to have her on. Uh, Alan, there's a few others uh, lined up. I've got uh, uh, Pawatua, I think is his name, a uh, Weber State football player turned opera singer. He's going to be joining us in August, as well as the return of Jeff McBride. You know, I fumbled that interview with my cousin so tragically a few weeks ago, a month ago when I was down there, uh, that he's agreed we'll do that uh, interview again. And so I'll have uh, the magician Jeff McBride on in August. So it's starting to fill up a little bit. Uh, but today I've got a great, great show, and John Ubaldo's an interesting guy. And after the 9-11 attacks, and he's going to tell us in the next segment, have we got him on the line? Yep. So hopefully he's listening. And I haven't spoken to John. We've ch exchanged some emails and some text messages. And I did watch his movie. It's available on iTunes. You can just download it. It's amazing. Uh, you watched it with me. It's an incredible film. Yeah. Um, the Bullish Farmer. You can just uh, log on, stream it. Uh, interesting world we live in. Uh, but when he, after the 9-11 attacks, he went back to Pound Ridge, New York, and he spent some time at his parents' house and uh, several months. And he was asked, uh, what did you do? And his answer was, I watched the snow melt. <laughs> and 
And at that point, he didn't know uh, what he wanted to do. And he sort of, uh, he's going to tell us a story about how he kind of fell backwards into farming in some respects. Uh, but I find that interesting, his, uh, uh, the passage of time. You know, he just needed time to sort of sit at home and to let things unfold. He was about to make a major transition in his career from Wall Street investment banker to uh, round, the co round the clock, seven days a week, uh, 365 days a year being a farmer, scratching out a living as a farmer. And he's basically tried to do it by taking on the current agricultural norms which dictate uh, prices and livestock feed and the use of uh, pesticides. I know that Roundup is big in the news. And John is one of the few farmers uh, that feeds his cattle uh, pure grain without pesticides. And he's got a following of people that believe in him and the health benefits uh, that accompany that uh, good food, as well as the community benefits uh, and the relationships that he's been able to develop and foster by uh, sort of redefining himself or finding himself. And his movie starts off, uh, it's rather uh, sort of deep and inspirational, but it starts off with a quote that if you had the chance uh, to change the world or to change people, uh, would you do it? Uh, would, you, would you take that chance? And we're tapping into him now and uh, John, I think I got uh, John Ubaldo on the line. Can you hear me, John? I can. And uh, that first question in your movie, first of all, how are you, bro? It's good to hear your good. voice. Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm uh, delighted to have you on. Uh, I was fasc yeah, I've fascinated while, with man. the movie. Fascinated <laughs> with the movie. Uh, so I got I to gotta start with the first quote in the movie, John. Uh, you know, you've got the quote, if you, if you had the chance to change people, how could, how could you pass up on that? Uh, and... Is that how you sum up your farming? Uh, sum up your life for me. Um, you know, a lot of people, I'm not going to say a lot of people, so many Americans are just stuck in their lives. Um, and it really does take a certain amount of sacrifice and stepping out of the box to be able to change people's lives. Um, and my original game plan was really just to uh, move upstate and live off the grid. Uh, that was it, but huh? But then, as you know, as as I had the opportunity to do so much more for so many people, it kind of kept dragging me back down south and dragging me back into Westchester in New York City. And everything just kept building from there. And obviously, um, you know, I became a little bit more ticked off as I found more and more what was going on with the food system. So, um, you know, at the end, it says to me, it just happened. And and that's kind of that's well, kind of John, true. It, these I things kind of, kind of don't just happen. I mean, you uh, you must have had some deep propensity for this in your movie. You talk about aspiring to be a farmer when you were a kid. Yes. So, so we, gotta, we gotta remind the, you that. We gotta go back to that. Well, so, you know, listen, I, I grew up in Pound Ridge. When I grew up in Pound Ridge, it was a rural area. Pound we always Ridge, had sub, animals. Suburb of New York City and Westchester County, right? Yeah. About how far out of New York City? Give it. So it, it's hard to believe that, you know, years ago that living an hour outside of New York City could be the boondocks, but... You know, in the 60s and 70s, that's exactly what my town was. And we had way too many relatives in upstate New York and Maine that, you know, we went and worked on their farms in the summertime as kids. Uh, so it kind of stuck with me on what I, uh, you know, and my game plan. So I originally went... Uh, I re originally went to Wall. I mean, when I left Skidmore, um, a buddy of mine was working on Wall Street, and I said, "I'm not going to work on Wall Street." I sent another um, one of my roommates down. He was thrilled to get a job down there. Who was that? Jamie Goldberg. Jamie Goldberg. Sure. I don't know if you remember sure, him, I but remember um, Jamie. just to give you a flashback, we were roommates in Dogwood B, which Dogwood says you know B. doesn't exist anymore. Um. So after he started telling me, yeah, there was money to be made, my wheels started spinning, and I actually had a 
five year plan in and out, found a farm. It was more of a a gentleman farm kind of program, and then my mother and my grandmother convinced me out of it because I was only in my 20s. Let me just give a little context. You graduated college in 88, I think, right? Oh, do you really have to go there? Yep. (laughs) 88, right? So we're talking early 90s when you're on Wall Street? Yeah, so early 90s, I I think by 94, yeah, 94, 95, I was ready to go. My mother and my grandmother convinced me out of it, said I was young, I should have some money, and then I spent, um, you know, then I spent eight, or eight more years there after that. Um, so it, it was, you know, it was kind of in my early plan to do. So after September 11th, you know, I decided, okay, this is probably the one shot where I have an excuse to do it and without people thinking that I was too... Uh, without people thinking I was too insane. Too crazy. <laughs> uh, quitting your job on Wall Street and starting a farm. John, where were you on, on 9-11? Were you in the city? Uh, yeah, no, I was uh, I was in the city. We were actually driving up the FDR, and I remember looking up and thinking, like, some jerk from Westchester County crashed his Cessna into the, into the towers. <laughs> yeah, you saw it that clearly. And it was, you know, because it was that high up and you really don't have that much of a gauge of distance, you know, you know back then. So we were expecting, uh, there wasn't even anything on the radio or anything yet. So we just thought some guy, you know, crashed his Cessna and we had plenty of uh, people. My brother-in-law worked at Cantor Fitzgerald and he said, you know, no, they're just telling us to stay put. Nobody really knew what was going on, and by the time we got to the office, the second plane had hit, and you know it was pretty much uh, it was pretty much a blur from you know from there on out. And he worked at that big brokerage that lost so many people. Yeah, he was um, a bond trader at Cantor Fitzgerald, twenty four years old. Wow. So uh, you know, I had I got married on nine eleven out in Park City, Utah, and I had my entire family in the air on nine ten, uh, flying back into Newark in New York City. Uh, woke up in Hawaii uh, to nine eleven, and I had uh, relatives that are in the financial industry, and it was just devastating for uh, so many that that knew so many people and that that had so many relationships taken away at that time. Yeah, I mean that was the bizarre. You know, that was a bizarre part about it because you were used to making certain phone calls to certain people in the morning, you know, whether it was updates and don't forget it was like the real, not really early, but early stages of like internet contact. Um, But then all of a sudden, uh, you know, here you are a few days later and those people are all gone that you're used to making phone calls with and... You know, obviously, I spent a lot of time with my brother-in-law, so it was, uh, you know, it was just, it was just a really, really, you know, it's a hairy time. Yeah. Hey, let me jump ahead as we're uh, closing in on the end of the first segment here. You are now the subject of a documentary, "The Bullish Farmer." Yeah. Uh, available on iTunes. How long has that been out? You know what? It actually came out June eleventh on iTunes. Um, it had spent the past two years on the film festival circuit and won, I think, close to 30 awards. So it was picked up for worldwide distribution. Um, and now, yeah, now it's on iTunes, which is pretty cool. Uh, and what are you doing as a follow-up, John? As a follow-up to the film? As a follow-up to the film. Are you uh, just <laughs> growing your empire? Well, there is there there is no uh, uh, there definitely is not a follow up plan at this point. My goal with the film was really to have you know three hundred and twenty million people see it um, because I really think that the people in this country need an extreme wake up call. Uh, so I do go to colleges. Um, and now that it is really out on iTunes, we can really begin to. Uh, you know, we can really begin to push the subject matter and everything and, you know, get more and more people to see it because, 
um, there aren't many Americans that are educated on the subject, and that's kind of scary. Hey, let me cut you off there, John. We're going into the first commercial. When we come back, the extreme wake-up call. I'm going to get into the details about the food industry, and uh, I'm hoping you can educate us. Very good. Be right back. Back, uh, Salt Lake City. It's Talk with Ted, number 35. John Ubaldo's got a farm. And I got uh, farmer John Ubaldo on the phone here from New York. And, John, I just want to read a little news story that's here in the news in Utah. You know, there's incredible development going on here in Utah and there's uh, news about farmers, and the Utah Department of Agriculture and Foods got a, a new commissioner, Terry Gibson, and there was an article just last week about raising suicide awareness uh, among farmers, that it's become such a stressful existence for so many. Only about 1% of the population in Utah is involved in uh, food production, and the uh, commissioner of agriculture here is asking Utahns to give a little more forethought to their food, the source of it, where it comes from, and uh, there's some effort here to support some local farmers. So uh, we think that your word is spreading out here. Great. Uh, what should we be alarmed about, John, in our food? Well, just uh, just real quick. The, um, the suicide rate in farmers is actually over two times that of uh, veterans. Really? Um, it doesn't get much publicity, um, but that is the current statistic here in uh, the grand old United States. So, um, you know, the fact that people are so removed from the food system and the fact that people most of the time just have no idea where and how their food is made um, really has created an atmosphere where uh, no, nobody even pays attention to the farmer, who the farmer is, where their food came from. So your biggest problem right now in this country is that there's well over 1,200 different chemicals and pesticides used in food production, um, but you're probably your biggest culprit and the one getting the most publicity and the one that is most pervasive and the one that is probably responsible for um, us being one of the sickest. We are actually the sickest developed nation in the entire world um, is, is round up and everybody has focused on it. And obviously there's been a few high profile lawsuits. Um, but the truth of the matter is, there isn't one scientist, one company, one person, university in the world that can tell you definitively if genetically modified crops are safe or not. The, the, the research... What does it mean to be genetically modified, John? I'm sorry? What does it mean for something to be genetically modified? So what they do is they insert various genes... Um, into the DNA strand of, say, corn or soy to produce, um, to produce different results. So I will give you the two highlights that when given this grand technology of what Monsanto decided to do with it. Monsanto decided to insert a gene into the DNA structure of corn that allows it to basically basically digest Roundup. So when you spray uh, corn with Roundup, the plant doesn't die, but everything around it does. Uh, the other m amazing thing that they did with it is they took um, the Bt toxin, which is a natural pesticide that lives in the ground, um, and they took the genetic material from the Bt toxin and put that in the DNA strand. Um, all of these layers of different traits are put in the DNA strand to produce certain results, whether it's pesticide or Roundup immunity or any of that good stuff. So what happens is there is no science that exists that can tell you what happens protein-wise, DNA-wise, as you make these modifications. Nobody has gone past just looking at what the desired result is. So 
The truth of the matter is, there really isn't. There is no anybody in the whole entire world that can tell you if they're safe or not. Obviously, there's all kinds of anecdotal evidence, and obviously the paid-off people on the other side are going to say it's fine. That's how they got it passed. Looks like corn, smells like corn, it is corn. Despite the fact um, that it's been sprayed with Roundup. So then you have this little insidious product called Roundup, um, which the main ingredient is glyphosate, which tested on its own um, is not harmless but not as nasty as when you turn it into Roundup. Um, Roundup is so pervasive in our food system that when this, <laughs> when this product um, was basically being used heavily in the United States, the USDA said to Monsanto, you know, give us the efficacy of this. Test the GMO corn and tell us if it's safe and give us limits on what you think are good levels, safe levels of Roundup in your food. So obviously Monsanto turned around and said, yeah, the corn is safe. Because there were so many lobbyists and Monsanto employees and the key decision-making positions in the U.S., they said, yeah, it's safe. What year are we and talking it, about, John? I'm sorry? What year are we talking about there? So you're talking about the mid-90s, because this stuff basically um, was started to be grown in 96. So anybody born, let's say, from 2000 on um, has grown up eating genetically modified foods with um, Roundup in their food. So just to give you an idea, mm, I would say about five or six years ago, we reached the limits in our food that Monsanto themselves deemed excessive. Um, and there was a big hoopla about it, and the EPA said, screw it. We're just going to up the allowable limits. Um, and so now, even... Even levels that Monsanto said were excessive for human consumption exist in probably 75 to 80 percent of the food in the supermarket. So that in itself is probably the biggest um, problem, you know, the biggest chemical issue that we face as humans. It is used everywhere. And so, John, if we uh, want to, we want to try to avoid it. How do how do we avoid it? What do we look for? Well. You know, now you're going to get into another pickle, which in the United States, the only way to really go around it is to buy uh, organic food from the supermarket, which certain people are going to bitch is too expensive and elitist and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the other place to get it is obviously from farmers and farmers markets, um, which you're going to hear the same, you know, argument from people who, for all intents and purposes, are lazy and don't cook anymore. Um, but <laughs> if you if you eat quality foods and whole foods, you don't need to eat as much. Um, Roundup is not allowed to be used in the production of organic um, vegetables. It's not to say that it's never used around the fields. Um, but in order for anybody to use... Uh, to grow enough, you know, organic food to go into a supermarket, they're using a whole new profile of chemicals themselves. So if you really wanted to be a purist, it's a know your farmer, go to the farmer's market kind of thing, which is which is difficult in this country. Yeah, and, and so you are a purist. You basically operate a farm where you feed your animals uh, natural feed, right? Pesticide and chemical free? Um, yeah, I'm pretty much... Uh, yeah, I'm pretty much a nut when it comes to it, correct. Uh, um, and you've got a, a profitable farm, I'll call it. Is that fair to say, your operation? <laughs> yes, let's say as profitable as a small farm in America can be because we have our own issues blocking us from being profitable <laughs> that make it tougher. Um, but yes, I mean, we do grow our feed. We do grind it fresh every week. We use only... U.S. sourced organic vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and, you know, species-specific herb and spice combinations. 
Um, we spend a lot of money on the front end, so we spend zero money on the back end. We have no drugs. We have, you know, no treatments for the animals. The animals are very healthy, so... Um, you know, John, I, I think the, the, the small farmer is kind of a, a lost person in this country almost, you know, a, a non-seen uh, a person. Who are your uh, competitors uh, up there? I mean, yeah, are, there, are there a bunch of small-time farms supplying uh, the big industry? How, how is, where's the food coming from? Which you know, that, food? That's a loaded question. The, the, the mass, the mass food, the food that uh, that we've been eating that we get off the grocery uh, shelves. Uh, yeah. So the the food that hits the grocery shelves comes from, you know, comes from what are typically called pack, uh, factory farms or confined animal feeding operations. I mean, you know. Some of these places have 10,000 pigs and, you know, two people who, who run the whole operation uh, and basically just walk around with beepers and are notified if water shuts off, food runs out or anything, and they just basically keep this factory-type operation going. Sounds automated. It's, it's all automated, and, you know, chicken, the same thing. But, you know, let, let's, I mean, we can go on with this for a long time, but let's be real simple. If they say, you know, if you believe that you are what you eat, we are a bunch of people that are eating, you know, sick, paranoid, doped up, poorly fed animals. <laughs> And that probably describes a very decent amount of the U.S. population. Flip the TV on. Uh, so, you know, we're eating from a food system that in itself is toxic. We're eating from a food system that is just inherently dangerous. And we're eating from a food system that is really very close to seeing, um, to seeing a collapse, which could really put us in a you know, and a huge problem. And nobody cares because they want McNuggets, they want Doritos, they want, uh, you know, whatever it is. But autoimmune disease, autism, I mean, the, the, the amount of disease that's on the rise in children in the United States and people that I see and consult is just so much higher than the rest of the world. Um, way higher statistically than the rest of the world, that it all obviously points, you know, to the food system. So without a change in consciousness, um, we are going to be, you know, statistically, children born, you know, from 2000 on, um, have a very, very good possibility that their parents will outlive them. And, and these numbers are just growing and growing. Amazing. I, I'm just kind of slack jawed here. We're talking autism uh, 20 minutes in, into the show. When you became a farmer, did you think you'd be doing uh, press appearances talking about uh, health and autism and farming? No. Uh, listen, I started farming to grow food because I wanted to taste food like when I was a kid. Then it turned into developing food that was like the most nutritionally dense food you could grow. Then it turned into protecting my son and children from eating from this conventional food system, um, which is a huge focus of mine. Um, and now, for me, it's just kind of an all-out, you know, it's, it's all-out, what are you people doing? Like, you have children, you have grandchildren, you have families... You, you need to make changes in order to, A, protect their health, B, leave a little bit less of a disaster than we inherited, and to do something to make change. It's really hard, and I don't even know if I say it in a film or not, but for me, it's just really kind of hard to sit around and have all this knowledge and not do anything about it. You say it in a film. You say you are unwilling to uh, sit on your ass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that probably didn't begin. That's true. And, and but I think like anybody who 
Anybody has to have the knowledge that, you know, McDonald's just might not be good for you. And I I tell you, it's particularly hard here in Utah. You know, I'm from New York. There's great restaurants in New York, great delis, diners. And in New York, in Utah here, it's all kind of uh, standardized, commercialized. A lot of the, 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 uh, you know, the factory restaurants, I'll call them. Yeah. Um, you really got to search out the uh, the unique places. Of course, we've, yeah. got, we've got the farmer's markets and stuff, too. But uh, I'm amazed, John, you go into the supermarket and all of the apples are perfect. They're beautiful. Uh, they, they almost don't look real. Uh, and that could be true even if it's February, you know. And I often uh, think about, you know, where did that apple come from? How long ago was it on a tree? How many people touched it from the time that... Uh, you know that seed was planted until uh, it uh, uh, broke. Uh, you know my tongue or on my lips. Um, but you know there's a lot that goes into uh, into food production and a lot that we don't know about. Yes. Um, yes. And I'm amazed that uh, we've been eating those pesticides for uh, for so long. Basically, almost uh, unknowingly, you kind of tend to uh, forget about it in your mind. No, I. I mean, I, I think so many people have been so removed, and this was the intention to remove people so far from the food system that they didn't, that they don't think twice about where it came from, what the consequences of eating it are. Um, and now you've got you those know, anything uh, of that those companies, nature. those uh, chemical companies, also playing a role in sort of the uh, uh, the futures, right, or the commodities, the product itself, the future, the future seeds, and the. Uh, kind of have their their claws in the uh in the business end of it as well right that makes it tough to access the the pure commodity um i mean yeah which is why like you know we backed off and decided just to control everything from you know start to finish um because this way you can you know you can kind of control your own destiny you control your expenses better you're not at the whim of a cargill or an archer daniels midland you're not getting like you know subpar food for your animals it's it's a it's a subpar food make up for that with cheap drugs um, the hell with the conditions because they're not going to be around very long. And where is the price point where we maximize our profit? Not you know, not thinking twice about quality or you know what it means to the consumer down the road. Yeah, John, we're going into another commercial break. When we come back, I do want to talk a little bit about the business of farming, uh, sort, of, <laughs> sort of that aspect of it with the uh, the nickels and dimes and what it costs to run a farm and how what lengths you have to go to uh, to produce that uh, that high quality food. I think it'll help the listeners better understand uh, where their next meal comes from. Uh, Absolutely, we'll be right back with Johnny Baldo. Welcome back, Salt Lake City. It's 4:44 on June 25th, 2019. A sunny but cool day here. We got the water running off the mountain pretty good still. You know, John, I uh, got John Ubaldo, farmer from Cambridge, New York, uh, on, and he is uh, the subject of a documentary called "The Bullish Farmer: A Film Fit for Human Consumption." And John's teaching us about food production from uh, start to finish uh, so that we have a better idea of what it is that we're putting into our bodies. And we're talking about uh, genetically modified uh, things. John, I saw an interesting article in prepping for the show about a chestnut tree in New York. Are you familiar with the chestnut tree up in Syracuse that's been genetically modified? Yeah. Uh, that there's uh, <laughs> the chestnut tree. Uh, they, they brought in chestnut trees from Japan in the late 1800s, and they had a, a fungus or something that attacked the American chestnut tree. And this resonates with me, because anybody growing up in uh, my hometown knows we had a great chestnut tree out in the, out in the front lawn. Um, but many of them, 99.9% of it wiped out by a fungus. And so they've developed a way to take some uh, organic material from this Japanese tree, I think, or modify it and inject it into an American chestnut tree. And it's the first uh, living thing that they're thinking of sort of integrating with nature. And they've got the tr- uh, one of these trees in Syracuse, I think it is, um, and there's a big debate, and the uh, uh, the chemical company uh, Mon- Monsanto—I uh, don't know if I'm pronouncing that right—they um, were actually uh, 
uh, behind some of the funding for the project too, but it raises some uh, interesting questions about uh, genetically modified anything. Mm -hmm. Well, the way it was sold to me when I was growing up was uh, they came out with the square tomato, and they said, which makes more sense, Alan, to package and ship square, square tomatoes tomato? or round sure. ones? And Johnny Apples are perfect when I go to the yeah. grocery store. Yeah, they are. Is that not normal? Um, well, there's two things. You know, there's, there's a couple things with the apples. A lot of it is um, the hybridization over the course of so many years. Um, obviously, you know, obviously the sprays, um, the sprays that they use on apple trees are some of the nastiest. And even the tree trunks and branches themselves are sprayed with antibiotics, which is actually even allowed in organic agriculture. Um, but the chemicals, I mean, you try and bite into a Granny Smith apple, um, you know, one of those ones that comes from like Washington State or something, you could lose a tooth. They're like, their heart is a stone. And um, why and is that? To make them so that they're fresher longer? Well, they, to A, to stay fresher longer, B, to handle being bounced around in bins, mm. um, and obviously for storage and shipment and, you know, and and everything. Uh, there actually is the new CRISPR technology out there for genetically modified apples, which are hitting the shelves, obviously unbeknownst to anybody because there's not a stitch of labeling in this country. Um, that don't turn brown. They don't turn <laughs> you know, brown. After, after, you, after you cut them open and let them sit. <laughs> oh, yeah. The endless apple. Yeah. You know, uh, Ben and Jerry's ice cream has got a gum in it to keep it from melting, uh, melting a little slower. But uh, the Ben and Jerry's used to not have that uh, back No. Then. But, yeah. uh, you know, listen. Ben and Jerry's. They send some money down to save the rainforest, and they get away with murder. I mean, they're, they're very... You know, yeah, they're uh, they're corporate. They're right? one of the sellouts. Just put it that way. I mean, you know, it, it, you can you can keep the persona of tie dyes and all that crap, but look at the ingredients, and it's just like you know what what the hell happened here? You know, in Saratoga, as you remember, we had one of the what was, it might have been the second or third Ben and Jerry's. Yep. Um, back, and none of those ingredients day. existed in there. Yeah. Right, they, they, they sold out years ago. Was it uh, General Mills did they sell out to? It's either that or Unilever. I don't, I, I yeah. don't really remember. I don't ones. even... Yeah, but there's the gum. There's gum. I was looking at the labeling uh, just last night. There's gum in Ben & Jerry's. Uh, they, don't have yeah. that, they don't have that gum in haagen -Dazs, But that gum is to help it so it doesn't melt as quickly in transport. It doesn't melt as quickly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they're doing all, all the same with the food. But, John, I want to get back to... Uh, Kind of set, setting up a farm, because it's really a remarkable thing that you did. You know, leaving a secure career in Wall Street, leaving that money behind, having, uh, you know, the uncertainty. I understand that uh, you're in a place that maybe you didn't uh, vision yourself going when you, when you first started. But, but how realistic is it for someone to get into farming, especially if they want to do it like you're doing it? Not. Not. No, it is pretty much... Um, it is pretty, the, the financial barriers to entry make it pretty impossible for anybody who doesn't have a substantial amount of money or backing, um, to do it. I mean, especially if it's livestock, if you wanted to go buy 10 acres of land and put an acre or two of vegetables on there and, you know, that's one thing, but if you're going to do any sort of... Uh, livestock production or, you know, crop production or anything that it's, it's literally impossible unless you have, um, an absolute fortune. And I know because I started with a fortune and, um, you know, it goes from there. <laughs> you know, the, uh, the guy that founded Snowbird Ski Resort named, uh, Dick Bass, he has a saying that he, uh, uh, if you want to, uh, uh, have a ski area take a take a large uh, what does it take a large fortune to uh make a small one yeah you can turn it into a small i mean you know agriculture the costs never stop the costs continue to go and you know just because you were talking about the economics of it so let's say you go to a farmer's market and you look to buy a steak and you're like 
Jesus, this is, you know, this thing is two or three times, maybe even four, what I could buy a steak for in the supermarket. You know, what people don't realize is, like, if I take one pig into the processor, just one pig, it costs between five and six hundred dollars to get that pig processed. One beef is between eight hundred and a thousand dollars. Just to get so, it cut up. Just to have it cut, packaged, and ready to go. So I go down. I'm standing there like a fool at the farmers market or whatever. And the first thousand dollars of beef that I sell goes to that slaughterhouse. It doesn't even begin to touch my food, my electricity, my grain, my taxes, my mortgage, fuel, anything. So in order for it to even be a little bit more than, you know, in order for it to even be a break even, um, you need to sell your stuff, obviously, at multiples of what, you know, stuff costs in the supermarket. You and so it it becomes a little bit of a educational process that you know it it, it can take years. <laughs> it can how take long, years. How long do you have any particular cow before it's brought to slaughter and and sold? Um, I have my own secrets with that, but we probably uh -oh, we're getting, raise we're getting them into the secrets to a year longer than conventional do. Um, the pigs we raised almost twice the age of what um, the conventional system does simply because um, I did a little thing about aging meat on the bone many years ago. And really, the older the animal, the better the meat quality um, is if they're you know raised properly in a stress-free environment with good food, water, plenty of forage, and you know, place to move around. That's got to impact your bottom line another so year of life. that definitely, it, it, A, it impacts the bottom line, but B, it helps create a following of people who, um, who appreciate and understand, A, the nutritional value, B, the meat quality. Like, I didn't do this to go out and, like, stump for, you know, all natural farming and biodynamic and this and that. I figured... If I was able to produce something that was exceptional, um, that people would come back. And at that point, as they began to get hooked on the food, that I would begin to start peppering them with the message. Um, and, and that's really how I didn't come with the message first. I made sure that I was in the market with a product that people just rarely see. Um, and, and that kind of gives you the ability to be, you know, a little bit of a loud mouth like I, you know, like I am. You're a little bit of that. <laughs> uh, the, 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 movie, the movie shows that. Yeah, that's a great show. Uh, <laughs> it's very funny and clever. John, you were, uh, you were a legend in college uh, b before your time. Uh, really? We, we had some fun back in the days, you know, chasing around the Grateful Dead. And uh, uh, you're kind of living that, that hippie life, that... Uh, that self-sustained, uh, fulfilling life. Uh, your movie shows that you know you're in touch with nature and the animals, and developing uh, relationships with the animals. Uh, let's talk about that for a minute. Uh, I know you got a uh, in the movie you show uh, Slaughter Day, uh, and you basically say uh, goodbye to the animals that you've raised. Yeah. So you know, unique, just to, just to back up it. You know, I obviously, I live against the grid, and I work hours and times and in the middle of the night and um, just on a schedule that I don't think a normal person could understand. Um, but for me, you know, there are a lot of days when I actually do feel like I'm stealing a little bit because I am outside all day. It's irregardless of the weather, you just... You learn to embrace it. It could be 20 below. It could be raining. It could be hot. Whatever it is, just the fact that you're out there in all of that, uh, in all of that energy. So, when you're raising animals to the level that I do, and I have um, very certain ways that I do it, and they don't. You know, they only drink well water, and their water troughs need to look like swimming pools and be crystal clear. And 
um, enough feed and forage so there is no stress. What people don't realize is part of the um, part of the ability to raise really, really good meat has to do with the level of stress that the animals are under. Um, because stress produces various hormones and burns fat and, um, you know, creates a completely different quality and nutritional profile than a bunch of animals that for all intents and purposes are just chilling out on a farm. And is that your, your personal experience? The stress of the animal affects it? No, there's no question. Affects the quality of it? There's absolutely no question at all. And, and part of that, um, you know, part of that stress um, comes from how they are handled by you and their interaction with you. I, I mean, I, I used to get phone calls from all over the country of people saying, you know, oh, my pigs, I can't get in there with them. They're biting. They're, you know, and I always used to just say, I have to be very honest with you. It's not them, it's you. And, you know, that usually ended the convert. You know, say, do the animals ever talk convert. back? I'm sorry? Do the animals ever talk back to you, John? Yes. Uh, I'm sure they do. <laughs> what was uh, Animal Farm was the book, right? We yeah. Supposed to read you know, that. Pigs, are, pigs are very similar to humans. And um, so your interaction with them definitely determines how they treat you. Uh, so yeah, we, you know, and I also, my farm's not, mot- you know, not, uh, automated. Um, it's hand feeding three times a day. It's watering from, you know, either a truck or an actual hose. <laughs> um, and you know, we're on the farm, like that's what we do. So, uh, there's just a lot of interaction a, because I like it. Um, B, I'm just, you know, amazed by all of these animals, but, you know, the energy that's given off between, um, you know, between human interaction and actually the acceptance by an animal is a pretty hairy thing. So, you know, it's a huge part of it. So, yeah, like when I have to send a, you know, when I have to send a beef in or something, um, you know, it's not the best day. Um, after, I think this is year number 16, I'm a little bit more used to it. I still take my pigs in. Um, but it's just the thing I do is in completing the circle and keeping myself grounded and still appreciating everything instead of, I, I could be in the house or I don't know, I could maybe go on vacation or. I don't know, go buy a clean T-shirt or something. I don't know. But hey, can I, can I put you on hold for a couple of minutes while we go to, uh, to a break? I want to come back and uh, talk about the circle life of a farmer. Yeah, go for it. Uh, John, we'll be right back. Welcome back, Salt Lake City. It's Talk with Ted number 35. John Ubaldo's got a farm. I've got uh, New York uh, farmer John Ubaldo on the line. You still with me, John? I am. <laughs> and as a little bit of a setup, we got a top, top of the hour here, so it's drive time. we got some commuters on the street in Salt Lake City. We're always encouraging people to drive safe. But just by way of a little recap, uh, John and I went to Skidmore College together back in the mid-1980s back in some uh, wild days and uh, i've got skid more to credit for uh, getting me behind a microphone 25 30 years later but uh we're catching up and john i found you on uh, facebook you've got a fascinating life story about leaving a career in investment banking following uh, the 9 11 attacks transitioning into a new lifestyle identity career uh in farming and you've pretty much uh taken on uh, big ag, uh, the the big farming industry. There are a plethora of issues surrounding farms. We're all dependent on them. I'm going to read from another Utah news story here, John, just in the paper last week about as the population of Utah booms, farmers are having to sell their farms, you know, and they're getting offered big money to land developers. And we're seeing a lot of old farms be turned into uh, housing developments here in Utah. And there's some real heartache that goes along with that. People think, oh, that's uh, easy. They should be glad they've got the money, the land. But uh, 
uh, there's great heartache and I know that people uh, don't want to sell that land and they don't want to see those old farmhouses uh, get knocked down and have that uh, culture change and so I think it's an important issue with food production with uh, community involvement even a sense of personal security to know uh, where your food your life source uh, comes from and we're really quite detached from it in our uh, modern society aren't we John correct uh, can you share with us first because I find it particularly interesting your uh, the time in your life when you were uh, basically ending your career in Wall Street, mulling over this decision uh, to become a farmer. I know you spent three months in Pound Ridge watching the snow melt. And uh, what what was it that you went through during that process uh, that enabled you to kind of evolve, evolve into who you are now? Um, okay, first, just one quick stat on that statistic that you were reading out of the newspaper about, you know, farmers selling their land. The average age of the farmer right now is about 62, 63 years old. And in the next 10 years, 50% of all farm equity in the United States is going to change hands. Um, the biggest problem we face is most of that is not going to be handed down to the children because the children have very, very little interest in living the way that mom and dad have, you know, struggling their whole life to make ends meet and working so hard. And so that land can only, A, disappear to developers, B, be bought up by more big agriculture, which means more chemicals, lower quality. Um, and the system could really, the face of agriculture in the U.S. without giving um, you know, giving the younger people, the children, and the family the opportunity to do something different, make money, something. It's got to be tax uh, incentives really or subsidies. the face of agriculture. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of, you know, uh, money, money talks. There's truth in economics. And if there's not an economic incentive to produce good quality food, then it's just not going to get produced. No, then you're, then you're just an idiot like me. Uh, but how are you defying the odds, though, John? Uh, how are you defying the odds? First, you know, I just want to kind of break it down. Can you give? Can you describe for us basically what you did today? I'm assuming you. Um, I'm assuming well, you worked the farm you know, today. I'm usually up at say four thirty. Four thirty. Um, especially this time of year. Um, and you got 180, 185 acres. How how many uh, cattle do you have? Uh, we have 116 head of Black Angus cattle. We have about 146 Berkshire pigs. Those are beautiful and, animals. I'm sorry? Those are beautiful animals. Oh, they're, they're awesome. And just like our, our, you know, all of our birds, chickens, ducks, geese, turkeys, there's probably about 700 of them in total. Um, and usually the day ends, you know, when it's, uh, when it's dark. So I was more than happy to do this to get a break from the day. <laughs> but when we're done, I will have to go, you know, back outside and finish. I hope you, I hope you get a meal in between. So, yeah, I mean, with the exception of coming in for breakfast and then dinner a little later, we're, you know, pretty much outside. Who's, who's much. we? How many have you got helping you? Uh, on some days one, on some days two. One or two, that's it. Yeah, that's it. That's it. It's amazing what you can get done if you work all day. It's, uh, it's quite a concept. Uh, does your wife work the farm with you? No comment. No comment? Uh, <laughs> what, what's her name? She's in the movie. She's quite lovely. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Move on. Okay. Uh, your kid. Um, How old's your kid? Uh, August is probably the best worker I have. Um, August can drive four wheelers, tractors. He can tell you how hydraulics works. He is super diligent with the animals and super responsible and, um, is really getting an education that no school could, you know, possibly provide. How old is he now? Uh, he's six. Six. You know, he would say, oh, what, he's not 14 or something? No, he is six years old. And can do everything, even trying to get 
into driving the dump truck, but that's hopefully not going to happen for a while. But and how, how um, did you get your skills when you uh, you know were down there in Pound Ridge, deciding to change your life? Uh, did you know what you were doing, John? No, and my whole you know my whole thing was just to try animal husbandry, and I have definitely made every mistake. But I honestly. Um, most of my education has been trial and error. Um, from seeing the film, you'll see that Mr. Larson, um, the old man in there, Jim. is pretty much the reason why I'm still here today. Um, if he didn't get me through my first year, I probably would have bailed out if he wasn't the voice of reason and education and showing up at my house at two o'clock in the morning when it was six degrees out to help me move pigs around i definitely wouldn't be here so that's jim, jim larson a farmer there upstate what county yeah, are you jim in, larson in white creek who you can't even give a shout out to because he doesn't have uh, a computer a cell phone or even long distance on his phone he's also he's also never worked a day in his life according to uh, his testimony in your movie. <laughs> None of the old timers will tell you they ever worked a day in their life. And you know what, listen, I'm getting old, I'm getting into that realm and uh and I and and I completely understand. So without having him, um I would say I mean I don't use veterinarians or anything for the beef for the cattle, I pretty much learned that one on my own because cattle people are pretty cagey people and they don't really, I don't know, it's a different than pig people. Sounds like a, a mentor. Everybody needs a mentor. Sounds like he was yours. I mean, there's no question, but, you know, if you start thinking about it, these guys in their 70s now, you know, as they, you know, as they move on, you're losing such a wealth of information that the next people coming up along the line are all chemical and drug and some par feed based, you know, trained or learned or however you want to look at it, that, you know, you're losing that knowledge of how to completely raise pigs and animals in a natural environment because that's the way, you know, that's the way they grew up, you know, yeah, doing it. So I'm glad you mentioned that. I found that one of the most interesting parts of the, of the film, your efforts to go through to uh, create the recipe for the grain for the pigs to eat, right? Yeah. Um, and there's some information in the movie about some of the additives in the grain that's out there uh, uh, in bulk. Uh, what, what, do we oh, got? What, do we, what do we got in our food? Oh, boy. So, I, I mean, I'll, I'll give you just like the prime example right now. Dairy farmers right now are getting paid pretty much what they were getting paid in the 1970s. So in order for a dairy farmer to survive... They need to produce milk at the cheapest possible cost that they can. Could you imagine the crap that is going into making milk right now that is hitting the supermarket if their very survival depends on it? So there is. I'm, and, I'm and, afraid and to I speculate. What? I'm afraid to speculate. Well, I'm afraid you know, to think what I was that. saying, what I was saying in the film, you know, is very true. Like chicken feathers is a main protein source, and you know, I have a Cargill plant by me. And the day that the train is dropping off the fillers, like um, like chicken feathers and these cheap sources of protein, the area just smells horrible. And on the days when they're dropping off the fillers, like the candies and cookies, and like you almost want to pull over when you drive by. But you know that's what they're mixing in: distiller dried grains. There, there really isn't much of a nutritional component to it. So, how is it that you're going to produce, um, you know, animal products that have any any nutritional value to them? It's really and and I'll give you an you know I'll give you an example. Um, you know the largest pork producer in the United States, Smithfield, was bought by the Chinese. They now control the majority of our pig production in the country. Thank you. Um, and they have plants around the country, but their flagship plant is in North Carolina. North Carolina. 
99% of the pork produced in the United States is grown using an additive called ractopamine, which is a failed asthma drug that they somehow found out promotes leanness and muscle growth in pigs. So they said, screw it, and it's in all the feed. So every time you buy a pork chop or something in the supermarket, it's been treated with a million other things, but a failed asthma drug. In the North Carolina and how long has that been the case, John? What? How long has that been the case? Because I feel like oh, as an ignorant that, member of the public, it just kind of, you know, these things just sneak up on you. There's no information. Well, well over a, well, well over a decade. I would say maybe even 20 years. Okay. Um, been going on for ages. But in the North Carolina plant, they, tra- they process pigs that are not treated with ractopamine. Um, and all of that pork is shipped to China. The rest of the garbage stays here in the United States. Really? Um, you know, they, so, they manufacture so it differently, eat different than what they make here and sell to us. The hell yeah. I mean, listen, like Kraft macaroni and cheese, you get shipped over to Europe, no preservatives, no dyes, no coloring, no any of that crap. Kraft macaroni and cheese here in the United States is filled with all the garbage. Like, you know, it's cheaper and Americans are stupid. So it just, it, you know, it just goes on what we are allowing to go on in this country it, it, and for the sake of cheap food is like it's beyond insanity. It it, it it is beyond the rationality of a human being to say, screw it, poison me, I just want it fast and cheap. It, just the coloring alone too, right? The food color and the food dye. The the dyes I mean, listen, pretty much every single ingredient it has some sort of adverse um, has some sort of adverse effect on your health, literally, down to the damn noodle itself. So, uh, you, you know, you're you're looking at it. You're looking at a system that we accept, and uh, it, it's baffling to me. Do you eat anything out of that system, John? No, never, 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 never once. Never will my son. Um, no, it's it's just. I have a relatively narrow diet. I try to eat as seasonally as possible, but I would never, I don't even go into the supermarket. Um, I even found like, uh, they just built a dollar general. So we don't even have to go to the supermarket to get toilet paper and paper towels. But that would be the only reason I've ever been to a supermarket. I do not go because supermarkets are designed to take advantage of people. It is it is down to the square centimeter how everything is stacked, packed, organized, um, and the way they bring you in, it's like it's, it's it, like it, a makes, casino. it makes fools out like of you. Love, like a casino. John, we're up against another commercial. Uh, this is fascinating stuff. I'm going to ask you to uh, hang in there. We're going to learn a little bit more about uh, how we can uh, access the same food that you are. Be Very right good. Back. Be right back. If you want- it's really weird. Am I on now? Okay, yes, that's better. Uh, John, you still with us? We got John on? I think you got him muted. John, you still with us? Yes, I am. Uh, John, I'm going to read from the website from uh, the movie The Bullish Farmer to set this up for folks that are just joining us because we're live on the radio in Salt Lake City, 1640 AM uh, on the AM dial. It's a beautiful Tuesday afternoon, and I've got... Uh, John Boy Ubaldo, a farmer from upstate New York, a graduate of Skidmore College. And I'm going to read here uh, from the website that promotes the film, The Bullish Farmer. Uh, Over a decade ago, John Ubaldo, a.k.a. John Boy, a successful Wall Street investment banker, decided to call it quits. Distraught over the loss of his best friend in the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center, John traded in his high finance career for 185 acres of land, on the Batten Kill River in Cambridge, New York, to live a quiet life as a small farmer. John wanted to farm the way it was done 100 years ago, raising a variety of livestock and crops. His only goal was to raise delicious and nutritious food for himself and his extended network of family and friends. But John's dream of living an uncomplicated, traditional agrarian life gets complicated when he comes up against big agriculture and realizes that his methods are not in sync with today's prevailing agricultural methods. John, the very private farmer, becomes a passionate and outspoken activist, lobbying for GMO labeling, animal rights, the preservation of crop diversity, and the reduction of chemical fertilizers to help preserve small farms and rural America. Uh, John, I find the last two uh, 
words there in rural America. You're really out to do more than just feed yourself, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, and you've got, uh, in the movie, it shows, you know, that you bring your product to market down in uh, Pound Ridge. How far is it from uh, Cambridge back down to Pound Ridge? Pretty much three hours on the nose. So it's three hours uh, yeah. up, up to uh, Cambridge. And then you've also got a, a little uh, diner down there now. Is it called the Outpost? Yeah, the Outpost is kind of a marketplace of food. Kind of wanted to have, uh, you know, an alternative to the supermarket and show people you could actually eat at a 1,500 square feet instead of 150,000 square feet. Uh, and, and by the movie, it looks like you got a lot of regulars that come there that kind of treat your little restaurant as sort of a second home. Yeah. <laughs> it is, uh, you know, I've been, this is my 16th year. There is a lot of kids that were in strollers that are now going to, um, you know, that are now going to school or graduating, going to college. There is a lot of kids who were actually sick when they were young, who are no longer sick um, because of some of the things we've done. Give a, give us a, give us a little more details on that because in your movie you've got a couple of profiles of some kids, one that with autism and um, and his mother's working with you on nutritional things that uh, change in people's lives. It sounds like. Yeah, I, it, you know, a lot of people. You know, listen when when people come to you. And they have a 10, 11, 6, 8-year-old kid that's sick or, you know, my biggest thing is, is teaching people that you don't have to be allergic. Your kid doesn't have to be, have glutenitis. You, you know, you don't have to send your kid to school with all of these afflictions if you would just clean up. Um, if you would just clean up their diet and, you know. I, John, I even things like anxiety them. and depression, do you, do you have experience with that? Yeah, you, you know, you have to understand that a lot of this, a lot of this stuff is triggered. Um, you know, so putting your kid on medication is probably one of the worst things you could do. It's a slippery slope into more medication, et cetera, et cetera. But the only way that you can really almost detox your kid um, is with food, and it takes diligence and it takes time. And it and the scary thing is that you have to cook, which um, you know, most people don't anymore. Um, you know, if, so, I, if I were an NBA player, you know, hit the big contract, uh, the jackpot, the lotto, I'd have a chef. Uh, I'd love to have, <laughs> I'd love to have a chef at the house, uh, to, to, to make those meals. Cause I struggle, I struggle finding good food and taking the time, uh, to go shopping for it and taking the time to properly prepare it. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm guilty like the rest of us Americans where it's just I mean, the no fastest, question. quickest. It, it, it takes work, but, you know, how do you want to, let's say the first 50 years of your life has been great. What do you want to, what do you want, you know, the, the most important part of it is like, what do you want your, what do you want your next 50 to look like? Like, how do you want to go out? Do you want to go out in a bed? Do you want to go out like in some home? Do you want to be like some shriveled up dude on a machine or, you know, do you want to go out in a million other ways that you would think of going out, and preferably in your sleep? Um, but back in the day, everybody died in their sleep. Everybody died peacefully, old, otherwise, not hooked up to machines. You know, it's a conscious decision that, um, that you need to make. And I, you know, I call it defiant eating. Like, we eat incredibly. And my son is, you know, the same way. You know, we eat. In a way that we are, you know, defying a system that is just hell bent, you know, hell bent on poisoning people for the sake of making money. Period. There, there is no other reason for this. Yeah, John, let, let's talk about. I'm um, curious about that. What what it takes to feed a pig? Uh, you know, you hear in sort of pop culture, a pig will eat anything, right? In mob stories, right? They give the bodies, put the bodies in the uh, with the pigs because there'll be nothing left <laughs> yeah. of it. Right, they'll eat the bones and all. Um, but uh, what do you feed a pig? You know, so 
the base is the, you know the basic of feeding a pig um, is really knowing you know okay what is a diet pigs do not you know the idea of a pasture raised pig pa- you know everybody preaches this pasture raised pig thing um, pigs don't really like grass you know pigs like what's under grass they'll tear it up and eat the worms and the roots and the bugs and so you know I make a very simple grain. Um, for the pigs, alfalfa corn field peas. Um, in there is probiotics, in there is cinnamon, in there is garlic, is kind of a natural deterrent to them getting worms because I really don't like to worm or use drugs. Um, so it's a very basic, you know, so the a garlic's very basic. got a medicinal value. Yeah, I mean, it's a very, very basic feed. Then the real part of it. Um, is the 16 acres of woods um, that they're able to roam. In those woods is some swamp, some marsh, some springs, um, tons of oak trees that obviously drop acorns that they um, that they flip out about. Oh, really? Cool. Um, apple trees, um, and you know, and plenty of forage and. Last year was the first year that we actually did it. Um, we have a group of moms that are pretty well behaved, fairly well behaved. And so we basically just uh, set them loose. Um, and they cleaned up. They found every single oak and ate every uh, acorn that there was and then slept all over the driveway and up by the house and in the fields and with the cows and everything. And then as uh, before the snow fell, we you know herded them back into the uh, into the big area. So, It's, you know, it's forage. I mean, it's really a hard thing to continuously produce. And that's part of the Um, having a natural environment so that they can uh, eat even what's produced there naturally? Yeah, I mean, sleep in the shade, eat apples, acorns. I mean, truthfully, like, if you put, you know, pigs on nice green grass and, you know, preach pasture-raised pigs, they'll bulldoze it. I mean, they'll flip it over in... Uh, and turn it into mud and dirt in no time. So the idea is to give them a big enough space that you can rotate them without giving them the opportunity to trash the place because that's what pigs do. That's why they raise them conventionally on, you know, on concrete because, uh, you know, pigs are bulldozers. They like to root. They want worms and bugs. They're omnivores. They'll eat frogs and snakes. And um, what's the average life of a pig at the farm? Um, well, the average life of a pig for um, for meat is about 14 months. Um, the conventional system is probably about eight. Um, but, you know, the mama pigs are four, five, six years, um, depending the on how they are. We've got some cows that are 12 years old that still have babies and do great and, you know, teach the younger ones. So we... You know, we keep them around. Um, okay, I want to go. I want to go back to what you feed a pig. So you said the alfalfa, the peas, and then you make the uh, cinnamon mix. Uh, yeah. h- how do you get the alfalfa that hasn't been tainted by the pesticides? That's all. We 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 grow everything. You grow everything. Oh, everything is grown locally. I'm, and you know, it's either me or my friends on land that. I know of and who's doing it, and we all kind of, you know, we all kind of pitch in. So, are you buying any feed from anywhere? No, hell no. <laughs> no, make it all yourself. No, I've been, you know, I've been through just about most all of them, uh, and you'd just be surprised what they think is something normal to go into animal feed. Um, that would really, you know, that really is just kind of goes against any normal way of thinking, but the idea of making it cheaper is the only really thing they think about. So You mentioned chicken feathers. They actually put chicken feathers in the feed? I, listen, chicken feathers is the main source of protein, uh, along with soy, but chicken feathers is the main source of high protein in livestock feed in the United States. And how would we know, as the general public, whether there's any uh, chicken feed in the uh, or uh, chicken feathers in the uh, food food <laughs> supply that we have? 
You have, you have no idea what you're eat, those animals are being fed. Yeah. John, I mean, I have no idea. Have you been involved in any uh, legislative efforts on the legal end at all? Um, I used to do a lot of that. Obviously, I'm... Uh, uh, obviously, I don't take no for an answer. And obviously, I used to be a salesman. So I have very, very unique ways of working with politicians. Um, and so, yes, I was always involved and always got called in. But, you know, a politician would say, yes, yes, the bill is going to go through. And then, um, you know, something, it would get tabled. It would get, you know, and some other kind of crap would always happen. So... I decided to just refocus my energy on educating people because change never comes from the top. Change comes from the bottom. In Europe, they don't have this shit because the people don't eat it because they don't want to buy it. I mean, it's... Um, and that's you know, basically it, right? They're educated enough to uh, not want to consume it? Yeah. I mean, and, you know, and that's kind of a, you know, that's kind of a big thing is educating enough people so that... Uh, they stop buying it. Supermarket supermarket shelving is is I swear is down to a centimeter and calculated almost on an instantaneous basis. If that shelf space is not performing, that product gets switched out. So if people would just be smart enough to not buy those products, they would be switched out. Uh, you know, almost immediately, like people don't realize the amount of power that we actually have, but you need to hit a critical mass. There's 5 million people in this country. Maybe let's push it and say there's 10 million people that have this level of consciousness. The other 320 million people are just stoned out on junk food and on time and computers and yeah, a little and time and that that pressure and even the uh, feels like we don't have we don't have time to uh, prepare our meals these days. Uh, forget about sitting down and enjoying it with the family. No, uh, no. I mean, listen. Even these meal delivery companies that'll drop stuff off. All you have to do is put it in your pan. I mean, even they're struggling because people don't even want to push it to. You know, don't even want to push it to that level. It is it is a huge, huge problem in this country. So, John, how what can you point to that would kind of like get get us to really uh, wake up? Because you know the the chemical industry wants us to believe that you know that the uh, that it's not hurting us that uh, the mass production outweighs uh, any any downside. Um, you know, and they point to the lack of evidence that we're. Uh, killing ourselves. Uh, well, what, what, what do you what do you say to that? I know we're sort of in a period of uncertainty. No, we 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 definitely are not. We definitely are not. We have the highest level of autism of any developed nation. We have the highest level of autoimmune disease. Um, we have the most. Um, we have the sickest childhood population. We have the most amount of kids on drugs. Um, you know, what, what is it that is the common denominator? And it's not like, well, rich people don't get it. It's only a poor thing. It is an across the board thing, which means it can only boil down to, uh, to the food system. I mean, you know, we're, we're probably by 2020, no, by 2030, by 2030, autism in the United States of America will be one in two children. We are at one in 64 right now. Denmark is one in a thousand. Why, why is it that there is such a huge difference in autism in the United States and other, you know, compared to other countries? It is the basis of our food system. Why are our children so sick? Why do we have statistics coming to the surface that show that these these children could be outlived by their parents? You can take the graph. This is a really cool thing to do. You can take a graph of the rise in autism, and you can fit it, and it will fit exactly over the graph that shows the increased use of Roundup in this country. Exactly. They are identical. 
one hundred percent. They fit like a glove, one over each other. So, you it's know, terrifying. the chemical companies have to push this because you're talking about billions and billions of dollars. I get it, but it's up to the American people to really take a step back and be like, why is my children? You know, so many people come to me. Well, we never had this in the family. It didn't run in the family. No one's ever had this before. It's like, hey, you know, you know, where did you get it from? Did you did you go through the X-ray at the airport? No. Yeah. You you know you, you feed your kid when you're a child and you're growing. Your your cells are splitting by billions and billions and billions every second. So what is feeding that cell growth in your body is 100% responsible for your health later in life. Uh, John, when you were in the last commercial break, when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about growth hormone and milk. Uh, big topic in Vermont back in the day. And I find it interesting, too, this whole discussion about big ag and the time frame kind of correlates with the opioid crisis uh, with the uh, drug manufacturers. But uh we American citizens are up against our uh, giant corporations for our, for our health and uh, sustainability. And we'll be right back with farmer John Ubaldo. Welcome back to Talk with Ted, number 35. John Ubaldo's got a farm. It's 543 Mountain Time, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Beautiful Tuesday day. Tuesday drive home. Uh, I've been enjoying the show. We've got uh, farmer John Ubaldo on, and he is the subject of a documentary film called The Bullish Farmer. Um, John, you've got a fascinating life. I want to talk to you a little bit about the movie. How did you get involved in in having a documentary film about your life? <laughs> so real quick, I used to do a farmer's market, as you saw on Pound Ridge, um, and because I was always pontificating, there was a huge line for the products, for the time to talk, the time and to question. When are you going to run for mayor, mayor of Pound Ridge? Not happening. I I bet you'd be a shoe-in. Oosh, please. <laughs> Everybody wants a farm, just not near them. Yeah, but, that's uh, like a sober living home or a residential rehab, uh, <laughs> not in my backyard. Yeah, exactly. Or, uh, elderly living or, you know, cheap homes. And this, not, not here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But when they came uh, and asked me if I wanted to do it, I, I said no. I mean, I for me, like, I couldn't fathom, like, why anybody would want to do a documentary on me. Like, it just didn't make you're like You're like the Kardashians. They're following you around. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a little bit bizarre, but uh, the producer actually got um, a friend involved who knew me, and they said, well, you know, let's sit down, let's have a drink, let's maybe kind of hash it out, and so I said, you know, listen, I didn't want to do one of those, you know, awful in-your-face kind of things. I said, I think we should just focus on the animals, and if you'll do that, which is why you see so much of them, if you focus on the animals, you know, then I'm in. The idea of it was I really wanted to pull people into the story, to the reality, to this is what it really is like. Um, I'm green. I came in. I didn't know a damn thing about what I was doing. And here's the reality of what I faced. You know, like nothing was, you know, made for TV done. So I really wanted to be able to drag people in, get them really interested in the animals and the, the whole life of it, and then begin to obviously give them the message of like, this is the reality. Like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not kidding. And before you guys like this thing ends, I'll give you the same thing that I tell everybody at the end of a Q and A. Like, if we get off this call, cast, whatever it is, if we get off this and you guys go about your daily life, then we just wasted two hours. If you guys get off this and the next day you make just one change in the way that you eat, educate one other person, have one other person see the movie if they don't believe you, then we're obviously, you are part of helping making the change. And that's what really needs to be done more than anything is as Americans, we need to start giving a who, whatever word, I don't know if I could curse in here or not, but no, we need safe, to really start curses. caring. You need to start knowing who your neighbors are. You need to start realizing that we are in this together. And one small farm like mine 
is, is not going to do it. There needs to be hundreds of thousands of farms like mine, because as we begin, people begin to get educated. They are going to need the ability to have these products available. If they're not, they're just going to go back to Mickey D's or something. So, John, what do we do about the costs? You know, because one thing, I live... Uh up outside of uh, Park City, Utah, you know, we got a Whole Foods, we've got five different grocery stores in town, you know, the place is uh, full of uh, all kinds of food. Uh, but uh, some of it, you know, uh, Whole Foods is, can be very expensive. Uh, what can we do to make it more affordable? And do we need government subsidies? Uh, what can we do to encourage, uh, yeah, you laugh, we can talk about some subsidies or whether... Uh, they have any impact on you, but uh, but what can be done to, to kind of turn it into more of a mass movement to make it more accessible to everyone? You know, it's it's a choice. It's a choice. Um, and if you eat really good food, you don't need to eat as much of it to be full. Um, and if you were to go to the farmer's market and buy one of my expensive chickens and vegetables and cook it for dinner, yeah, I'm probably 10 buck, bucks more than going to the drive through at Mickey D's. But if the next day you make like a stock or a soup or use it for something else rather than throwing 40% of it out, which most Americans do, then now all of a sudden, by putting that effort in, I'm cheaper than McDonald's. We don't, we don't think I of our deal, food as an investment in ourselves. We don't think of it that way. Well, n you know, nobody does. But, you know, it goes back to like... What do you, you know, what do you want to, you know, what do you want to do when you're older? I mean, do you want to be the, you know, one of those, you know, you want to be one of those old guys that's like still running around chasing the ladies or do you want to be the guy who's like stuck in the chair with a tube up his nose or something <laughs> or, you know, you have to so pick. So again, to the heart of it, it's about chasing the ladies. That's why you got the farm, John. Is that the essence of it here yeah, after a two hour it, interview? The, being a farmer is such a babe magnet. There you go. But, you know, we don't, we don't, we're, as Americans, we're not proactive. As Americans, we're not forward thinking. As Americans, we don't, we don't think into the future at all. And, and most other cultures, which are healthier and, you know, yeah, I always tell people you want health care. Like, are you out of your mind? You can't have health care. Like, everybody is too sick. If you're a preventative by nature, then, yeah, because you have a healthier lifestyle or because just as a population you're healthier. You know, it can't just be, you know, it can't just be one person. But I, I sell food into poor communities, rich communities. It is a decision. It is a decision they make to spend money on this type of food and they have smarter kids they have better behaved kids yeah they don't have iphones and you know a 200 hundred dollar pair of sneakers but they're very very well behaved and families are involved and so we've been programmed know, about cheap food we've been programmed about cheap food and to, i mean, uh, I mean there's, no, there's there's no question but cheap food is also like a drug there's Billions of dollars that go into creating those addictions and flavors and and everything. So it's it's a process that was created to keep you addicted, to keep you from thinking clearly, you know. And and that's what we crave as Americans. And and then that's the hugest problem. So, so if I'm confused, you know, I can blame it on my lunch. All right, right, John. You got me. Uh, you got me thinking here. Uh, yeah, but you know what? Think about if you eat one of those big lunches and you sit back and you're like, oh, you know, I need a nap. Like, after you eat, you shouldn't need a nap. After you eat, you should be ready to go for a walk or do something and not be, like, leveled out by all the crap that's in your, you know, that's in your food. We eat, we go out to work. We're not like, oh, man, I need to sit on the couch. And then later on, you crash because you've had, like, a cheap protein or too much sugar or stuff that isn't nutrition. You know, once you try this, once you begin to eat this way, then it's like, you know, people always say, what the hell is wrong with you? How do you work this many hours, this many different things, all these days of the week? You never take time off. You're always working. You're nonstop. Blah, blah, blah. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter because I am just constantly moving and constantly fueling, you know, my body with, with just good food. I'm, you know, I obviously you could see from the film I like to eat. 
Um, but it doesn't, I, I don't slow down from my food. And if you want to talk about like the consciousness of the people in this country, you can see from TV, you can see from everything how people in this country are just zoned into crap, believe the internet is telling them the truth, and have no idea of thinking long term or out of the box about how they should be living. Um, and, you know, I'm glad you said that. Uh, we've had some uh, great guests on and people that kind of think out of the box and give them people uh, creative di- ideas about uh, how to live. I really am touched by your movie because I know my personal experience, my eating habits are terrible. Uh, I find it exhausting trying to keep up uh, the energy to find the food to keep up with my appetite. I wish they'd invent a food pill. Uh, you could just take a, take a pill and uh, and be done with it. But we're not there yet, are we? No, no, but it, it's it's never going to work that way. So where do I where do I have to go? Do I have to look up, do research about the? Uh, uh, the markets or trust a farmer's market? Do we just need to uh, uh, invest more in our local farmer? And, John, how many families do you uh, support your your farm? I know you must have some regulars in your store. We, uh, I mean, we probably feed uh, between 60 and 80 families a week. 60 and 80 a week. Yeah. And you're at market every week with your produce and product? Every week, and then obviously through the outpost because we're open all week long. Um, you know, there are people that are really are um, dependent on the place. Like, I could never close that place down. Yeah, too many people um, are lying on you. Because people really do, people really do live this way. People have made this conscious choice. And i got to tell you something. You know, there aren't people that are like, oh, I got to step outside for a cigarette. I've never seen anybody smoke outside my store. Every kid that comes into the place is bright and bright eyed and is not staring at that little thing in their hands and is able to have a conversation and doesn't have their head in their parents' crotch and, you know, will give you a high five and say hello. And, uh, you know, it's it, we've created like a community of like yeah, really alert kids. Like, I feel good. I can depend on those kids. You know, as I get older, where there's a lot of kids that actually scare the hell out of me, that down the road, uh, you know, we're going to have that problem. So let's think about it this way. If one in 64 children in this country have autism, put this 20 years down the road, how is it going to affect our workforce? How is it going to affect our health care system? How is it going to affect all this wide-ranging economic and social and all these issues that we face, that we face right now? It, it would only make sense to try and reverse the process to have a more productive society. I mean, you know. And round, Roundup is really sort of the poster child of that, talking about reversing the process, because there was the, the verdict in California with the groundskeeper that got the uh, gigantic yeah. award for the cancer. And you see that Roundup is really in the news now. And it's not allowed in a large part of the world, right? No, not at all. But, you know, here you're looking at three lawsuits that total a little bit, you know, under $3 billion. There's 9,000 lawsuits plus behind it. Um, And, you know, they're still pushing for government protection. The government is still, in the face of the Supreme Court decisions, is still allowing this crap to be used. It's amazing. All all, all, uh, money, 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 right? It's all about money and all they put, all the people that they put in positions of power. And I, and I know people love the guy and think he was one of the greatest presidents ever. But Obama was one of the biggest, biggest, biggest. He approved more genetically modified crops than any administration in our history. Yeah. He had Michael Taylor, who was a lobbyist and a Monsanto employee. He put... Over 18 Monsanto employees, lobbyists, and otherwise in decision-making positions in our life. And not to say that the guy now is doing any better, because he's probably worse than allowing the chemicals because he's taken so much money from the yeah, chemical who, companies. Who's regulating the regulators? I mean, there is nobody. And you can probably check it out in the news. The scientists at the EPA have come up with... 
all kinds of bad findings, and now they want to move the EPA and get rid of the scientists. And, you know, science is an easy thing to manipulate in your favor. Sure. Um, and that's where the problem and the unsurety comes in and, you know, to keep people from being able to make a straight up decision on it. But I think you only need to look at where we are as a country and how sick all these children are to realize there really is just one bottom line to it. And you need to make some changes. That's amazing, you know, and I think that uh, my source uh, for inspiration here is going to be your personal observations, because that speaks louder to me than any uh, government statistics, and I think it's uh, pretty amazing. You've got a pretty amazing life, John. You're a blessed man, a hard-working guy, uh, but to have that kind of impact, influence, and to turn into a, a spokesperson for, I think, such an important and uh, critical cause of uh, of a lot of problems. Uh, you're you're really resonating with us out here in Salt Lake City. No, I appreciate it. The thing is, it's not something that I really. It's something I wish that I didn't have to do. But as a human, I'd really find it impossible to turn my back on it. Um, and that's a really hard thing to you know to kind of juggle every day while you are trying to have you know, uh, a simpler, more idyllic, more in control of your life kind of uh, kind of thing. And on top of it, being able to, you know, walk the walk at the same time. You know what I mean? It's like, um, I got to believe that uh, you, you feel like you live a fulfilling life, John, because uh, you, you got a different experience, a connection with nature, a connection with humanity that I don't think you'd have had, had you stuck it out on Wall Street. And uh, I want to thank you for your time. We're up against uh, the top of the hour. You're a terrific guest. I'll give you the last word. Well, my, I mean, if however many people that you guys are reaching out there, it really is time to take a walk, a think, look at your children, and really come to the realization that you need to leave something better than we inherited from our parents. Not knocking them, but we didn't inherit such a great situation. We are the generation that really needs to change it. Uh, you're the man. You always were, uh, even back in college. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to uh, take your inspirational words and try to uh, whip my butt in shape and take a little bit better care of myself and my family. So, uh, John, thank you for your uh, research work, efforts, and uh, and words. I wish you nothing but luck, bro. Guys, thanks for having me. I really sure, appreciate sure. it. I'll catch up with you on the outside. Sounds good. Johnny Baldo. And I'll be back next week with uh, Malcolm Lemons. Uh, uh, lessons from the game. Should be a good one on Tuesday. Uh, drive safe. Thanks for listening, folks. Uh, have a great evening.